All right, so I'm going to spend this hour talking about NIFT-P, and that might seem like a lot of time to talk about one diagnosis. However, if you're signing out thyroids, you're encountering NIFT-P, or you're thinking about NIFT-P in your differential diagnosis, and then it also has implications for cytology and for um, inter interpretation of molecular testing. All right, so what I'll be going through for this hour is basically um, how we arrived at the non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features, and thank goodness I can just say NIFT-P for the entire talk, um, and starting with just a history of follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, going through the encapsulated and infiltrative forms, going through the JAMA oncology study, and then I'm going to move to the implications for thyroid cytology and how to interpret molecular testing of thyroid nodules now that there's NIFP. So the instance of thyroid carcinoma has basically tripled in the last three decades, and papillary thyroid carcinoma is responsible for this entire increase. And while this has affected both men and women, you can see it's just a much more rapid uptick when, in women, so this has really affected women. At the same time, the mortality rate has been static, indicating that many of these tumors are indolent, and so recognizing which papillary thyroid carcinomas are indolent is really important to avoid over-treatment. So we know that ultrasound has substantially increased the detection of microcarcinomas. However, there has been also an increase in diagnosis of PTCs over a wide uh, size range, indicating that there's likely something else occurring as well. So the diagnosis of follicular variant was established in an article by Dr. Um, Lindsay in 1960, um, but then really further described uh, in an article by Dr. Rosai in 1977. And in this article, he wrote that the tumor resembled papillary carcinoma in its biologic behavior and all morphologic features, with the exception that papillary formation was not present in the primary tumor. All of the tumors in this group had a, at least focally infiltrative borders and five uh, of the cases were associated with lymph node metastases at the time of initial diagnosis or as recurrent disease. So these were real carcinomas, and at the time they were rare tumors. We are going to talk about nuclear features of papillary thyroid carcinoma, the revisited section. So we see a lot of thyroids, um, and often I sometimes get a little bit like, oh, another thyroid tumor. Um, it's the most common thing that we see in consultation, and often it's regarding a follicular patterned lesion, and the question is usually, is there enough nuclear features to uh, make the diagnosis of a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma? And then if it is, then we have to answer a number of other questions because we have our new category of whether or not it satisfies the designation of a NIFT-P, which is, and I'm going to actually use the journal article to remember the full name, non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. That is a long name. So from here on forth, I am just gonna re refer to that as NIFT-P. And um, I am going to take you through on how we get to that point, if we ever do. So our objectives is to look at the morphologic spectrum of papillary thyroid carcinoma and get a sense of how it's challenging for the various variant classification. And then I'm going to use the NIFP literature as a sounding board to discuss the nuances that are related to thyroid pathology. And before we even delve into that, I got to be real honest with you guys, just talking about thyroid pathology makes me super anxious because it's an area that is so fraught with variability uh, from one person to another. And this is not just in variability with regards to nuclear features, but even simple things as what connotates a papillae, and then even greater topics of what do we really define as invasion or angioinvasion for that matter. And it's when you take all of this together, it can become very frustrating. 
I can tell you my journey through just looking at tons of thyroids I've gone through an evolution of just the whole uh, perspective of thyroid pathology and have had to readjust my thresholds throughout when I started in residency I think my approach was pretty basic um, not that much dissimilar to what we're even thought in medical school when it, as it applies to the nuclear features and then once I started my fellowship training, which I did at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, Dr. Sitala, Raja Sitala, was my um, fellowship director. And it was pretty funny because I, when I started the fellowship, he would call a lot of things follicular variants of papillary, and I would not even recognize them. And then eventually I started really picking up and I swung in the other direction where I was calling everything papillary thyroid carcinoma. And I had to tighter back to really hone in on what the nuclear features are and where my threshold was going to be. I was asked to cover endocrine pathology, and it's a lot of material. I'm going to give the first lecture on thyroid. And obviously, thyroid is a huge area of endocrine pathology, and I can't cover everything. Um, I should start by saying also that if you're following with my handouts, I have cut some of the slides out because I gave you a lot of information in the handouts with references, um, but I won't have time to review every single slide. So if you have any questions at the end, I'm going to be giving you my email address and I'm more than happy to answer questions that we don't get to today. I do have to review my disclosures for you all. They're on the screen and let's get started with thyroid pathology. So the traditional classification of thyroid follicular neoplasia is the subject, is actually the, the beginning of the subject for my whole first talk. I'm not going to talk about C-cell lesions in this talk. That's going to be as part of the neuroendocrine talk. So we're going to stick to follicular epithelial cells that traditionally we've, we've understood to have benign and malignant tumors called adenomas and carcinomas. The carcinomas have traditionally been classified as well-differentiated. Uh, about the mid-80s, we recognize that there's a poorly differentiated variant and, of course, the undifferentiated or anaplastic carcinomas. Now, in the 2017 WHO classification, we ended up with some new um, introductions and a recurrence of something that had been deleted, the borderline lesions of NIFT-P and UMP, and the reemergence of Herthel cell carcinoma. And those are going to be two things that I'm going to focus on a fair bit today, just to talk about the reasons for these changes. In terms of the controversies that I want to review, they're listed on this slide, and some of them will go fairly quickly. Others are going to be pretty complex. Let's start with nodules in thyroiditis. And I have to tell you, this is actually one of the hardest parts of thyroid pathology. I'm going to sh tell you now my approach to this, but uh, I don't think we have a right answer because it's something we don't understand very well. We all recognize thyroiditis. There's no question that Hashimoto's thyroiditis is fairly common and it causes some fairly significant changes in the thyroid, everything from focal lymphoplasmacytic aggregates to uh, cytologic atypia and extensive fibrosis in very severe cases. The uh, cytologic atypia is what really gives us a hard time because first of all, these cells become oncocytic which is always worrisome, and they develop nuclear features that resemble those of papillary carcinoma. And so the question is, what does this cytologic atypia mean? I want to point out um, the concept of dysplasia, which most of us never really used in the area of thyroid, but there's a lot of literature showing that chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis does increase the incidence of papillary carcinoma, that's somewhat controversial, but it doesn't surprise me that the literature is confused because it's these nuclear changes that give rise to the difficulties that we face with nodules in this disease. And a few years ago, we published a paper suggesting that this can be what we should be considering dysplasia, 